So we've been uh, looking at the subject of eschatology, and we were studying how you study the Bible, the principles of hermeneutics, and we said within the principles of hermeneutics, there's two biases that people have. You either have a, a bias because you embrace covenant theology, or you have a bias because you embrace dispensational theology, and then that kind of guides your approach to the scriptures. Uh, we, being dispensationalists, have a particular bias, and we take the scriptures literally, where the literal interpretation makes sense. We don't seek to find any other interpretation for fear we come to nonsense. But in the covenant theologians, they do what we call eisegesis rather than exegesis. And exegesis is allowing the text to speak for itself, allowing the truth to come out of the text. Eisegesis, you put a bias into the text that you already have. A predetermined bias is what you want to see in the text. And so those are basically the two forms or two methods by which people interpret the scriptures, eisegesis or exegesis. But there's a new term that's been coined recently. What is it? Narcegesis. <laughs> <laughs> because we're such a narcissistic society now, you know, with all of the selfies and everybody's a celebrity, that people read themselves into every text practically, you know. That's called narcissism. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, and what, as we got into the subject of eschatology, we said that one of the major events, prophetic events, due to take place very soon would be the Gog, Magog invasion of Israel. The principal player would be Rosh or Israel. The leader of Magog would be Gog. And those aligned with him principally would be the Persians or the Iranians, Togarma the Turks. And so we see that in our day, never before in the history of man has there been an alliance between these three powers, these world powers, except in our day. That's fascinating, isn't it? But we look at the plurality of signs of the time that we're in. Time singular, but signs plural. It's amazing. Do you not believe that we're very close? Yes, yes, to the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, other than the Gog Magog invasion of Israel, what would be the next prophetic event that the church would be looking for? If not the Gog Magog invasion, what would we hope to see? The rapture, and that's what we've been talking about, the rapture of the church. And as pre trib, uh, premillennial dispensational believers, we believe in a pre tribulation rapture of the church. Now, I recognize that there are a number of good, wonderful, godly people who have a differing opinion or interpretation of the text. Uh, but, you know, we'll all agree in the end, won't we? <laughs> Hindsight is always 2020. And so when everything takes place and it's all completed, oh, of course, that's what I believe. <laughs> But we looked at some types in the Old Testament. I'm trying to uh, give you my apologetic for a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Some people don't even believe that the rapture is occurring, you know? But why believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church? I believe there's some Old Testament examples of that. And we looked at some of those last week. Do you remember what they were? Enoch. Enoch was the first example we looked at, right? Enoch was birthed, and when he was about 65 years old, he birthed a son, and his name was Methuselah, and uh, he developed a closer walk with God. Children will do that to you, won't they? They'll give you a closer walk with God. They'll give you a prayer life, right? But Enoch walked very, very close with the Lord. And we know that from what is shared with him in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. For Enoch walked with God and pleased God, and he was no more. Why? The Lord? But what does the text say? The Lord rewarded him. Then go to Hebrews chapter 11. It's important that you see this. I want you to understand this because I have a very particular interpretation of what's going to take place with the rapture. Uh, controversial nonetheless, but I'm convinced in my study of the scriptures that it's so. Chapter 11, verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated, right? In the twinkling of an eye so that he did not see death. He was not found because God had translated him. That's what's going to happen to us one day. Those of us who are alive when the rapture takes place, we will be like Enoch, immediately translated, changed from mortal to immortal. For before his translation, he had this testimony. What? That he pleased God. Oh, it's so important that we have a life that pleases God, right? 
For without faith is it impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is what? The rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So in the text, it's telling us that why was Enoch raptured? It was a reward for his faithful commitment and service to God, for his walk that pleased God. Sunday, we said that Enoch reached the vanishing point, which is where we all need to be, where, where we are so Christ-like that the Holy Spirit takes up residence in every area of our heart, in every area of our life, so that people no longer see us, but they see Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> we would hope that would be true, right? Yeah. So we looked at Enoch. Now, Enoch was a type of the church that would be raptured from the tribulation to come, who was a type of those who would go through the tribulation in that period? Noah. Noah and his three sons and their wives, they all went through the tribulation of that day, didn't they? They went through troubled waters, but God kept them at peace, right? Even in the midst of the storm, even in the midst of those troubled waters. But why would I say that Enoch apparently had a closer walk with God than did Noah? I'm sorry? Enoch escaped. Enoch escaped, okay, but is there any other evidence that would give you the ability to conclude that Enoch seemed to have walked closer with God than Noah? What did Noah do when he finally got on, off the ship and on dry land? He got drunk. He got intoxicated. He, he put himself into an altered state of consciousness. And, and, then, and then it was a shame for any man to be seen naked. And so he was. You know, we, we don't understand what a shame it is for an individual to be seen naked in our society today. We're so crass and so lacking understanding of what is decent and modest. But nonetheless, we see that, that Noah didn't have the walk of faith that Enoch had. But nonetheless, we looked at some other people, too. Who else did we look at? Elijah. Elijah. And we said, Elijah, he had such a strong walk with God that one day God took him. The, the prophets in the school of the prophets that Elijah had established had been told by God, had received the gift of wisdom or a gift of knowledge to know that God was going to take Elijah. And they told Elisha, his protege, his mentor, uh, your, your master, he's going to be taken from you this day. Do you know that? Yeah, 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 I know that. I know that. And it was interesting that Elijah was taken up. But who was left here? Elisha. Was there a difference in their walk with the Lord? Was there a difference between Elijah's walk and Elisha's walk that you could point to? Elijah always referred to the God as to God as his God, my God. How did Elisha refer to God in the beginning after Elijah was taken? The God of Elijah. Not his God. But the God of Elijah, the God of my master, Elijah. So he didn't have that strong, personal, intimate walk with the Lord that Elijah had. But eventually he developed that. He did twice as many miracles, didn't he? Yeah, he asked for a double portion of the mantle of Elijah, and he received that. But nonetheless, Elisha was left here. Elijah went. And what happened to Elisha right after he, Elijah was taken up? Was he harassed by anybody in this world? Sure, he was mocked and ridiculed. Remember, there was like 50 little hoodlums that kept badgering him and following him and mocking him. And, and finally, he had a, a bear come down and maul him. <laughs> right? You remember that story, don't you? Now, who else did we look at in the Old Testament which a type? Who? Lot. We didn't look at Lot. We looked at Daniel. 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 Daniel's a type, isn't he? And why do we say that? Well, what happened to his compadres, Mishael, Hanani, and Azariah? They got thrown into the fiery furnace. The fiery furnace was, and the, and the image that was created is a type of what? The image that the Antichrist will place in the Holy of Holies of the rebuilt Temple of Israel, demanding that all the world bow down and worship him, and those who will not will be executed. That was a type of what will happen with the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And so when those three Hebrew children wouldn't bow down and worship the image, it was a terrible time, wasn't it? For anybody who was a true believer at that time, it was, there was a tribulation, a persecution. 
And what happened? They heated the furnace seven times hotter than ever had been heated before. The very men that bound these three boys up and threw them in the furnace, what happened to them? They died from the heat of the furnace. Now, they went through a terrible time, didn't they? The fires of tribulation. But then Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace and he saw the three Hebrew children standing there. And who else did he see? One like the Son of Man. He saw Jesus, the Theophany, pre-incarnate vision of Christ, who was with the three of them. And then what, what did Nebuchadnezzar say? He, he called them by their Babylonian names. We don't like to use those, but he said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, right? Those are the Babylonian names. He said, come out. And they came out. They walked out of the furnace. Indicative of the fact that what? They could have walked out at any time. Why didn't they? Jesus was with them in the midst of that tribulation. You know, if anybody has gone through any suffering or tribulation or testing, you know that when the Lord is with you, right, Cheryl? When the Lord is with you, it doesn't seem to be a trial. It doesn't seem to be a, a testing or a suffering. And so those three Hebrew children, they walked out. But before they were thrown into the furnace, they said, look, we're not even careful how we answer you, O king. Our God will deliver us. He'll deliver us in the flames or he'll deliver us out of the flames, but he will deliver us, won't he? Now, the question has to be asked, where was Daniel? No mention of Daniel. Not at all. So Daniel, who's the type of? The church that is raptured. And the three Hebrew children, who are they a type of? The tribulation saints who will go through the tribulation. Right? And so we looked at that. Now, you, you might want to see it that way. You might not. I'm, I'm not interpreting the text in its technical sense. As I've shared with you so many times before, every biblical text has one technical interpretation. Now I'm making an allegory between these stories and the rapture of the church or the faithful and those who might be left behind. Because we know that the Bible is very clear. There's three types of saints in the Bible. There's Old Testament saints, there's New Testament saints, and then there's tribulation saints. And the tribulation saints that are spoken of in the book of the Revelation on chapter 6 and 7, is such an innumerable number of people from every tribe, nation, people, and tongue. So therefore, what are they? Every tribe, nation, people, and tongue. Therefore, they are Gentiles. Gentiles. They're not Jews. These are not Jews. But there is an innumerable multitude of Gentiles who are going through the tribulation. The question has to be asked, where did they come from? So we looked at Daniel, we looked at Noah, we looked at Elijah, we looked at Enoch. And, and this evening, I think, in the time we have remaining, I want to share with you some warnings that are in the New Testament, some that Jesus gives and some that the apostles give, the writers of the New Testament, with regard to the fact that Christians, the church, needs to be ready and prepared and watching and serving Otherwise, there's a warning here. Now, you know, it's, it's so frustrating when you're at a restaurant or you're at a gathering and you have these threatening, repeating parents, you know? I mean, it's just constant, right? I mean, they, they never really step forward and take any action, but they're constantly threatening these little guys and little gals that they're going to do something and they never do anything. So who's training who? You know, and, and that's not training your child, Right. Well, when Christ gives a warning, do you think it's necessary or is he just, just spouting off for no reason at all? You think the warning has some teeth? You know, you, you know parents, you're supposed to train your children to first-time obedience, right? <laughs> I think that's a lost truth today. But you're supposed to train your children to first-time obedience. It's good to train your dog that way, too. Right? So that you say what you mean, you mean what you say. Hmm? Well, I think God is the same way. So I want to present to you some warnings in the New Testament that really relate to us, to this generation. They didn't relate to the generation he was speaking to at the time because he wasn't coming then. He knew, he said, on this rock I will build my church. And he had a lot of building to do with his church, hadn't he? Yeah. But we know that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, what does that mean? 
When the church age is complete, that's what Paul talks about in Romans, when the church age is complete and the Holy Spirit is done working predominantly among the Gentile world, that the church will be complete, the, the faithful church will be raptured, and then God's Holy Spirit will be working predominantly where? Israel. Among who? The Jews, the Jews. And we know from that chapter in Revelation chapter 7 that there's 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. Apostle Paul's running around Israel evangelizing. Can you imagine such a thing? We know what one Apostle Paul did in turning the world right side up. But can you imagine 144,000? Hmm? And predominantly, again, working through Israel, that all Israel shall be saved. Does that mean every Jew is going to be saved? No, no, but Israel, national Israel, will be saved, right? All right, so one of the warnings is found in Matthew's Gospel, so turn with me there. And we'll get through a few tonight, and we'll carry on tomorrow, I mean, uh, next Wednesday. Unless you want to come tomorrow. Now, chapter 24 of Matthew corresponds or parallels with Mark 13 and Luke 21. What's significant about those chapters? That's right, they're all apocalyptic. All those chapters deal with the end of time, the second coming of Christ. Chapter 24 of Matthew, chapter 13 of Mark, chapter 21 of Luke, all of those are apocalyptic. It's Christ speaking with regard to the signs that would occur at the end of time, before the second coming of the Christ. Now, in Chapter 24 of Matthew's Gospel, beginning in verse 32, he gives one of the greatest signs that have occurred in our time. He talks about the parable of the fig tree. We've been through this many times before. Uh, just to refresh you, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches have already become tender, puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the very door. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. What is he talking about? A fig tree, leaves turn green every year. What's he talking about? He's talking about the nation of Israel. Now, remember, using the principle of hermeneutics, when something is used in a figurative sense, it'll begin to be used in that figurative sense in the Old Testament, and it will carry that meaning figuratively throughout the whole Bible into the New Testament. So whenever oil is spoken of in the Scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, what is it speaking of? The Holy Spirit. Brass or bronze, whenever that's spoken of, beginning in the Old Testament all the way through the Scripture, what is that speaking of? Judgment. Okay, and so the fig tree, Old Testament, New Testament, whenever the fig tree is used in a figurative sense, no pun intended, what is, what is it speaking of? Israel, Israel. Now, if you went back into chapter 21 of, Mar of Matthew's gospel, and you looked at chapter 21, verse 18, do you have a heading over that in verse? Fig tree withers. Fig tree withers. The cursing of the fig tree. Okay, very good. So Jesus was going into Jerusalem. He was going to have a confrontation with the religious leadership again because the fact was that Israel was not bearing any fruit for God. The tree, the fig tree was Israel. Israel was supposed to be bearing fruit for God, and the fruit occurs from the inside out, right? We want to focus, as, as believers, we don't want to focus on spiritual gifts. We want to focus on spiritual and the gifts will come. God will give us whatever gifts we need to accomplish whatever ministry he has for in our life. But our, our role, our responsibility, our stewardship is to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit to allow him to produce the fruit that he wants to produce in our life. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Self That's a biggie, right? And again, such... There's no law. You can't do it enough. <laughs> They'll never make a law to prevent you from doing that, right? Exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, now, Israel outwardly looked like it was religious. It was spiritual. It had life, didn't it? Yeah. You look at all of the busyness that was going on at the temple. People on the Sabbath, they're going in, going out, the sacrifices that are being made. But the Holy Spirit wasn't there at all. When did the Holy Spirit leave public life of Israel, and particularly the worship at the temple. In Ezekiel's day, Ezekiel chapter 11, 
and the Holy Spirit never to return until the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ, when he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit missing from their worship for all of those centuries, millennium, and they had no idea. And so God is revealing that Israel, which should have been bearing spiritual fruit for God, was dead, dead on the inside. Outwardly, they tried to show themselves, you know, like a sepulcher. What is a sepulcher? It's a box that you, you, you paint and you make it look beautiful and bright and cheery on the outside, but what is it full of? Dead men's bones. A sepulcher carries bones. It's a bone box, right? Dead men's bones. And that's what Jesus said Israel was like. And so, listen, so much of the church is like that today, isn't there? You know, only 20 per, 20 per, 20 per, 20 per, you get this, 20 percent? 20 percent of the church today believe the Bible literally. That it's literally the word of God and it should be taken literally. 20 percent. Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? No wonder why we're in the mess we're in today. You know, outwardly appearing to be spiritual, righteous, holy, but inwardly, ooh, it's not good, is it? No, 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 no. So Jesus curses the fig tree in chapter 21. It withers and dies. What is that symbolic of? Him cursing the fig tree. He's going to curse Israel. He said, not one stone. They said, Lord, Lord, look at these alethos. What's alethos? These temple stones. They're talking about the stones of the... Do you know that some of the stones of the temple, Herod's temple, were as big as this room? One stone? Long? As high? As wide as this room? One stone. And they said, Lord, Lord, look at this temple. Look at this grand place. Look at the lethos, Lord. Look at these stones. And what did he say? Not one lethos will be left upon another that will not be torn down. And just as he prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the worship of Hashem would end until the second coming, right? This is what is symbolic here in the cursing of his fig tree. Now, he, he, he prophesied specifically implicit in this cursing of the fig tree, implicit in the parable of the fig tree, but he explicitly said that there would come a day when Jerusalem would be destroyed because they were bearing no fruit for God. Is that not right? Okay, so when you get to this text, and this is so important in this 20, uh, 32nd verse of Matthew 24, learning the parable of the fig tree. The fig tree is Israel. When did life come back to Israel after it was cursed in 70 AD? Somebody mentioned 70 AD, right? That's when it was finally destroyed. And the worship of God ended in Israel. And the Jews were dispersed, the diaspora, throughout all of the nations of the world. God scattered them, right? When, when did they come back into the land? When did the leaves come back on the fig tree? May 1948 is when Israel was a nation among the nations once again after all that time. Where was the safest place for Jewry? Where was the safest place for the Jews who were dispersed in all the world? The United States of America. It was. It was. And who discovered America? Christopher Columbus. And who was Christopher Columbus? He was an Italian by nationality because he liked sausage and peppers. Right? He was an Italian by nationality, but ethnicity he was a... Jew. He was a Jew. And, and if you know your history, if you go back and you can Google this, it's, uh, the, the information is out there and available to you, but it's amazing how ignorant some people are uh, of the truth. Well, why should we be surprised? We're in an age of deceit. What is truth today? <laughs> but anyway, nonetheless, you can go back and you can discover that Christopher Columbus's purpose was to find a place, a safe place for the Jews during the Inquisition, during the, the persecution of the Jews. And so he discovered America. And it was Jewish businessmen from Spain who really supported his trip. It wasn't Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. You know, there were some Jewish merchants, very wealthy merchants, who were looking for a safe place for Israel. And it isn't any wonder they discovered the United States of America. And, and up until our modern times, there were more Jews in what city than any other city in the world? New York, New York City. <laughs> New York City had more Jews than any place else in the world, you know? It's not true anymore, though, is it? This is not a safe place for Jews any longer. 
But the leaves of the fig tree turned green. Israel became a nation among the nations, 1948. But it never comprised the landmass that it had when Jesus made this prophecy until 1967, the 67 war. That's when they conquered over the Temple Mount. That's when they had all of the territory that they had when Jesus made the prophecy. So there are a lot of good uh, Bible teachers and theologians who believe that the date really starts in 67, not in 48. You know, but either, what's, what's the difference? I mean, when you talk about thousands of years, right? What's a couple dozen? Hmm? So nonetheless, we are very, very close because Jesus said the, na the generation that sees this now, I was born in 51. Anybody born in 48? Roger, were you born in 48? 46. 40, oh, so you were born before. So you're, you're that generation, if it's 48, but if it's 67, so I, I can, I'm covered there. How many were born before 67 or around 67? Well, look at that. So we're the generation. How long is the biblical generation? I'm sorry? Well, that's a, that's a promise we have that God has promised his blessed, his beloved, 70 years, and by reason of strength you may have. I got my 70, so I'm ready. You know? <laughs> I don't need the 80. I don't need the 80. <laughs> you know? But nonetheless, a biblical generation, uh, one of the ways in which we calculate that is we look at the prophecy in Matthew with regard to the coming of the Christ and the generations that would precede him from Abraham to David, David to uh, the captivity, captivity of Christ. It's uh, 2,100 something years. You divide that by the 112. Let me, let me go back there and look at it. I'll tell you exactly. Chair, banana, sunrise. Chair. <laughs> my memory still works, OK? That, you know, I went, I went and had, a, had my Medicare physical yesterday. And, the, and they said, I'm going to tell you three words, and you've got to remember these three words. We've got to test your memory. Chair. Chair, banana, sunrise. See? I still remember from yesterday morning. Yeah, I get all done with the physical. They said, you'll know those three words? Yeah, I'm going to sit in this chair, wait for my banana, and the sun's going to rise anytime." And they never brought me the banana. Go figure. But anyway, this I didn't commit to marriage. So go to Matthew chapter 1. And verse 17 gives us a hint there. This is what some uh, Bible interpreters use to try to calculate a biblical generation. And so all the generations, I'm in, I'm in chapter 1, verse 17. Everybody there? Okay. So all the generations from Abraham to David are how many? From David to the captivity of Babylon are how many? From the captivity of Babylon to the Christ of how many? Okay, so how many is that? How many generations? 42, for you math, mathematicians. 14, 14, 14, right? 42. 42 generations. Now what do we need to know? How many years was that? How many years was it, Christy? I don't know. I, if my memory serves me correct, it's 2,160 years, okay? And then you divide that by the 42. Somebody have a calculator? In your phone? But you were supposed to shut off your phone, weren't you? Now we'll find out who was obedient. Ah, Gail. <laughs> I shut yours off. <laughs> You're always trying to shut me off. <laughs> Somebody got their calculator? What is it? 2160 divided by, 50, by 42. How much? Yeah, 51.4. That's right. That's the answer. So approximately, approximately 51.4 years, Okay. So if we take that and add that to 1967, where are we? I'm sorry? Overdue. We are overdue. Yeah. Yeah. How many, how many is that? 1967 plus 51.4. Two bananas. Two bananas. <laughs> 2018. Wow. Hey, the only thing, now listen, I'm not trying to set a specific date. What I'm trying to tell you is we're in the season. We are so close, beloved. Do you understand that? 
And so as I was trying to share on Sunday, it's so necessary that we purpose to yield to the Holy Spirit to reach the vanishing point. So that like Enoch, our life would please God so that we're no more. We got to go. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful? Hmm? Now, what's, what's, requ let's, what's required for you to be raptured? For a steward to be found faithful, right? But Jesus, Jesus said, listen, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we work miracles in your name? Lord, Lord. And what did he say to them? You didn't serve me enough. Your performance was inadequate. It was substandard. No. What did he say? It's all about the relationship. Listen to me. It's not about performance. It's about where your heart really lies. It's about a relationship. Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. Oh, yeah, you were busy. You were busy doing all these things to try to justify yourself before me and before my father. But it didn't work. Why? Because your hearts were far from me. Much like the religious leaders in his day. Right? Yeah. Hmm. I didn't get very far, have I? I've got to quit by 8.15 tonight. Um, for reasons known only to myself. But I have a board meeting after this, and I don't want Bridegroom and the bride. Yes. Doesn't get any more intimate than yeah. that. No, absolutely it is. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you know if you're part of the bride. And you know that he's your bridegroom. Be listen, because he is the master desire of your life. What, 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 what would stop you from wanting to be with him right now? Right now. Nothing. Nothing. The things of this world, pff, it's, right. it's all going to burn anyway. Right? Yeah. No, when we see Jesus, all of the things of this world fade away, don't they? Don't they? And, and no, no relationship with any individual in this life could compare to the real. We're thankful for the relationships we have, aren't we? Yeah, I was sharing with a, I was sharing with a fellow yesterday. He's 35 years old. He hasn't married yet. And we're talking about marriage. And, you know, and I said, well, I have two wives. He looked at me. I said, yeah, I have one in heaven and one on earth. I'm just a little concerned about when they both meet. Don't know what's going to happen then, but you know. Yeah, no, I mean, oh, up there. Well, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. It's all good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, just to make a funny. And just to make a funny. She loves you for the way you're taking care of me. Yeah. She does, she does. She's, she, yeah. And I hope Gus appreciates how I'm taking care of you. You know, he'll talk to me. Maybe he'll cook for me. <laughs> he was an executive chef. I'm hoping he'll cook for me for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> Where was I? It's an intimate relationship. It's the relationship that the bridegroom has with his bride. Do you yada the Lord? That's, that's the intimacy. To, he, depart from me, I never knew you. The Greek text is equivalent to the Hebrew yada. Abraham yada, Sarah, his wife, and she conceived. So what's a yada? It's a close communion, right? The I don't, I'm not using this in a coarse way at all. Please, intercourse, the highest essence and the meaning of the word is not a physical relationship. It's not when we have conversation, because that, that could be a meaning as well. It's, it's when the Holy Spirit presses his life into mine and we become one. That's the highest essence, the quintessence of the word. I never knew you. I was never a part of your life. You were never a part of mine. Isn't that what Jesus' priestly prayers were studying in John 17 was? Father, that your love would be in me, my love would be in you, and our love would be in them through the person of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we've been studying, right? We'll pick that up on Sunday morning. What are we learning in Romans chapter 12? What are we learning in Romans chapter 12? You know, the, the most humbling thing for me to do is to ask you what I taught on Sunday. Don't, don't be, you know, love Right. Uh, Learning to love in 27 days. For what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another. To me. Yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> no, but that's what we're studying. That, listen, that is when you reach the vanishing point. When those 27 aspects of love really permeate your life and others around you see it. You've reached the vanishing point. Praise God. It's all about Jesus. Right? Hmm. So Matthew 24, we're going to look at a warning here because Jesus gave us this meaning of the parable. Giving you that understanding that we're very, very close, but we want to look at chapter 24, considering a warning that Jesus gave, and we'll look at a couple in Matthew, and then we're going to have to call it an evening. Beginning in verse 36, he says, it be as in the days of Noah, right? Are we in those days? What, what were some of the things that characterized the days of Noah? What? Militant homosexuality. Militant. Militant. You remember Lot and how the men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted, wanted to take these men who they didn't know were angels and have their way with them in a physical sense. How sick. So Noah's day was characterized by militant homosexuality. What else? Sacrificing Child sacrifice in the worship of these false gods. What else? Violence. Violence covered the whole world. What else? What? But that's a good thing. You know, we got to, he said, be fruitful and multiply, right? Pharmakia, what was that? Drug use, drug use, yeah. <laughs> Rachel and her mandrakes, you know that story? No, yes, the mandrakes were a hallucinogenic. She'd rather get high than sleep with her husband. She'd rather get high and let her sister sleep with her husband. How sick is that? Hmm? What else? An obsession with what? The occult, the occult. You know, uh, before 1960, you'd be hard-pressed to find anything, any serious works written on the occult or Satanism. And, and now, now, every university in the country has a section devoted to it. As in the days of Lot. And as in the days of Noah. Now, what preserved Noah? David, you going fishing with me then, Honduras? You don't know yet? Maybe? Okay. We got, we got to keep the message to the Hondurans uh, simple because they're simple people. They're not, but but uh, the message that the Lord is formulating in my head is on Noah building the ark. Was Noah saved because he built the ark? Because he put pitch on the ark? Because he beautified the ark? He carved his name in the ark? No. How was Noah saved? Because he was in the ark. You've got to be in the ark, right? John eleven twenty six. 26, what does it say? For those who live in and believe in me, Jesus, they have eternal life. There's a difference between believing and living in, right? You can believe with your head, but not with your heart. You got to have both, the head and the heart, right? So we'll pick it up. Verse 36, but uh, of that day... And the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What day? The day when he's coming. The day that the, the uh, generation that sees the leaves of the fig tree turn green will see the end of the age. That's what he's talking about. But as of the days of Noah, so also the coming of the Son of Man, for as in the days of the flood, eating and drinking, marrying, giving and marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore... What does Jesus say? What did Jesus say? Watch therefore, for you do not know at what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming and, and when you do not expect him. Now, it's going to take the world by surprise. He says repeatedly in the New Testament, Jesus and his disciples say, it will be as a thief in the night. A thief in the night. Now, who is he giving this warning to? Who is he speaking to? 
Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 20. Who's he speaking to? The disciples. And the message wasn't for unbelievers. It wasn't for the world. Who's that message for specifically? For us. For the generation that would see the end. That you need to be ready. You need to be watchful. You need to be aware. Why? Because that day may take you completely unaware as a thief in the night. I believe he's talking about the rapture here. Uh, <clears throat> Another text will say two men in the bed. Now, it doesn't mean that they're homosexual. Somebody asked me that question. No, 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 no. Why does it say two in the bed, two grinding at the mill, two in the field, etc., etc.? Why does it say that? Oh, yeah, one is, two will be watching TV, they'll both be left. But, <laughs> but no, no, why, do, why does it say that? In each case, there's two, but one's taken, one's left. Why, why is it saying that in the bed, in the field, at the at the mill, it's, it's, it's global, it's worldwide. This event is a worldwide event. It, you know, Jesus is coming, and I know exactly what time he's coming. You know what it is? Two o'clock. Why do I say that? It's going to be two o'clock somewhere when he comes. It will, right? But, but that's what he's indicating here. It's global. This is worldwide. Now, I believe what he's referring to next is the actual second coming. Now, we know that the second coming of Jesus happens in two phases, right? The first time he comes for the church. The second time he comes with the church. First time for the church. He doesn't set foot on planet Earth. We meet him in the air. Second time he comes with the church. And that's when he steps foot on planet Earth, right? And I believe that's what he's referring to in the second part here in verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom, when his ma whom his master made ruler over his house to give him food and due season? Blessed is that servant who has master when he comes will find him so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come at a day when he is not looking for him, and in an hour when he is not aware of it, it will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now we know from our study in Daniel that we did previously, it was just the other day that we studied Daniel, right? And Daniel, at the very end of, the, of Daniel in chapter 12, he gave us a time frame. You remember that? Blessed is he who comes to the... Go to Daniel chapter 12. You know, I expect you to remember everything I teach you. No, I don't. That's why I repeat myself so often. God expects me to remember it and to teach you. Now, in chapter 12, Daniel gives us the time frame. You know, Daniel was blessed to give you the specific day in which the first coming of Christ would appear when he made his triumphal entry in Jerusalem. He's also blessed to give the second day in which Jesus will appear when he steps on planet Earth. Daniel was given that prophecy and that understanding to the very day. First coming, second coming, right? And so it says here, Verse 11, we'll pick it up there, chapter 12. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. What's he talking about there? Yeah, the last three and a half years of the tribulation period where the Antichrist, this man of sin, like the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up in the plain, a 90-foot image of gold, he's going to demand that the world bow down and worship his image that he puts into the rebuilt temple and the Holy of Holies. That's what they're talking about here. And when that occurs, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Jesus himself made reference to it in Matthew 24. When that occurs, there's only 1,290 days and it's over. Game over. Right? But then look what it says. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you, go your way to the end, for you shall rest, and you will arise in your inheritance at the end of days. Daniel, don't worry about any of this. You won't see any of this. You're going to go and die a natural death, and then you're going to be with all of your fellow servants, brothers, and you will gain your inheritance, and we will all come into the kingdom together at the appointed time. But what Jesus is referring to here is when he comes the second time, Hebrews tells us that, uh, where is it? Let 
This is an interesting verse, Hebrews. Yeah, Hebrews 9.28. Don't worry, we're going to tie all this together. It may take us a couple more weeks. So if it's a little fragmented for you, I'm sorry. But we'll, we'll pull it together. There's a lot here, you know. It's a lot to study. Verse 28 of chapter 9 in Hebrews, it says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Right? Once. Right? I'm an ex-Catholic. How many times was he crucified? Every, every Mass. Every time they perform the Mass, they believe they're re-crucifying Christ over and over and over and over. Nothing could be more. Look at the text. Jesus Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Thankfully, he bore our sins, didn't he? Didn't he? Thankfully, we're part of the many. But to those who eagerly wait for him, are you eagerly waiting for him? I can't wait for his appearing. There's nothing else I want more than his appearing. Is that true of you? Yeah. And for those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. Not to deal with the sin problem, but for a rescue. The word salvation here is soteria. It's a rescue. What's he going to rescue? Who's he going to rescue? The, the tribulation saints. The, the, the Jews, the tribulation saints. Those who had to go through that horrible period of time of which Nero was simply a, a type. He was a boy scout in compared to the man that's coming. And the brutality that he's going to exercise upon the world. But here, Daniel prophesied. In the apocalyptic literature, in the gospel, it tells us that Jesus' return happens at a very precise moment in time. Had he not appeared at that very precise moment in time, I'm not talking about the rapture now, I'm talking about the second coming when the church comes with him, had he not appeared at that very precise moment in time, what does the text tell us what happened? Whatever you said. No flesh would be left. In the Greek text, Everything would be destroyed on planet. No life would be left upon the planet. There wouldn't be a germ or a bacteria. You wouldn't have to worry about COVID any longer. Nothing would be. It'd be a sterile cinder out there in space. Do you know we have the capacity to do that now? Weapons of mass destruction that you and I can't even conceive of how powerful they are. You, you, and, you and I can't. We have no way of understanding the destructive power and the force of some of the armies of the world today, particularly Russia, China, United States, India, Israel. Nuclear weapons that make Hiroshima and Nagasaki look like firecrackers. I'm serious in the destructive capacity. So what Jesus is saying here is he doesn't intervene until that very moment where the whole human race would be destroyed if he didn't intervene. Now, why does he wait till then? I'm sorry? So we couldn't say if you would have gave us a little more time, we would have... Exactly right. You see, you see, you got to understand something. All of the angelic community, the fallen angels, the third that went with Hasatan, right? The two-thirds that stayed their place with Gabriel and Michael, okay? They're watching this whole thing play itself out. They're, they're not omniscient. They are not all-knowing. Satan's not all-knowing. And so they're watching God act and react to what is taking place in the world today, in human history. Now, people say, well, well if God's a God of love, why didn't he stop all of this now? What is the number one problem in our hearts? Why, why do we have such a problem with God today? Why do we have such a problem with the Ten Commandments? Because we're rebellious. We want to be self-governing, self-determining. We want to do things our own way. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. That's my rebellious heart. I know it's not yours, but it's mine. It's the world's. Isn't it true? I'm still trying to do the speed limit. 385. <laughs> I have to set the cruise now. I, I, said, I said, I'm going to set the cruise, dear. I, I promise. I'm going to watch everybody go by me and it just drives me crazy. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? Isn't it? You know, you see a sign say off the grass, what do you do? 
you know? Wet paint, don't touch. You know, that's the first thing you do. No, that's the first thing you do, right? Right? We're so rebellious. Now, that's the world. Now, if Jesus intervened right now, what would all the pro boards say? <laughs> that's the excuse. Listen, that's the great deception that's coming. I'm, oh, it's, that's another subject that's so fascinating. I mean, it is the great deception. It's, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable what's happening. Yeah, Satan is a master disguiser, isn't he? Deceiver. But anyway, nonetheless. Um, so Jesus, if he intervenes before that time, Satan, the, the demons would say, well, you just didn't give them enough time. They could have created their own utopia. They would have created a world of peace and love and joy. You know, who do you think you are? You have to control the entire universe, right? Man themselves. We, you know, what, is, what happens just before the return of Jesus Christ? Ungodly men who are there during the tribulation period, are they in repentance? Are they confessing before God? What are they doing? They're shaking their fists at God and mocking him, asking the rocks to fall upon them, hide them from the face of him who's coming, right? That's how rebellious our hearts are. So Christ has to wait for that precise moment. Why? So that all the world will know, every angel, every demon, every man and woman will know, only God has the ability to be exposed to evil and not be corrupted by it. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Eat of what? The, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God was trying to protect us and keep us only within the knowledge of good. Abhor what is evil, right? What does it say? Cling to the good. Stick to the good. Isn't it amazing how fascinated we get by evil? Whatever that evil is that you enjoy, you know. The donut job. <laughs> You know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. And, and so that's what happened, you see. God was trying to protect us from the knowledge of evil because we, we can't handle, we do not have the capacity to, expose to, e to be exposed to evil and not have it corrupt us. Only God, only God can be exposed to evil and not be corrupted at all. Tempted in every way that we are, but what? Without sin. Without sin. Without sin. And, and so he's going to prove to all of the angelic realm and the demons. He's going to prove to all mankind, anybody that has ever lived or will ever live after us, that he alone has the right to rule, to govern. What happens if God gives any man, any woman, their way? What will their flesh do? So your flesh's ultimate desire, whether you realize it or not, the Bible tells us, is its own destruction. Isn't that amazing? Your flesh's ultimate desire is its own destruction. Men love agapeo, darkness, rather than the light, for their deeds are evil. That word agape is just a, a highest form of love where you're willing to sacrifice everything and anything. Your love for that, whatever it is, is unconditional. And so men can love evil that way, can't they? We have lots of examples today, don't we? Drugs, alcohol, etc. So when the next time somebody asks you, if your God is such a God of love, why? Why is he allowing this to go on? Because you'll say you intervened too soon. You'll say you could have created your own utopia. You'll say you, you could have created a better world. You know what Satan says? Has God really said? Has God really said? Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? Hmm. No new lies. They're all old lies. They're just repackaged. Right? Yeah. Questions, comments? Terry, you got a final song for us? Shall we stand?